Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three adventures for old school D&D. The first two are Cairn adventures and the third one is for a unique system that I've only run across once or twice called Blueholm. So the first is Three Goblin Markets, the second is Exton, the Edge of the West, and the third is Blueholm, the Necropolis of Nuremen. Now, the first two were designed for the um, Cairn Game Jam last summer. I've, I've referenced before a town, a forest, and a dungeon. They are awesome. I think these are two top-tier adventures, and they are just delightful in a lot of different ways. Three Goblin Markets is perfect. There's perfect material for a Dolmenwood campaign. <laughs> Again, I keep coming back to Dolmenwood in these videos because I'm so excited for it. And I, and I tend to be on the lookout for things that would be useful in a Dolmenwood campaign. And three goblin markets would be awesome to mine it for little things, as you'll see, that would fit in a, in a uh, Dolmenwood campaign. Now, um, these three are all very... Well, they're all very different. Uh, three goblin markets is the, 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 the forest... Or I should say, excuse me, the dungeon and the town are almost incidental. The highlight is the forest here, because that's where these goblin markets are found. Uh, I'll go through it uh, in, in some detail, because I think this one is really worth spending a little time on. So the layout is great, very clear. The PDF is 15 pages in this spread form, so probably about 30 pages in individual pages. The story that's going on here is there's this, there's this town with a giant stone and people worship it. And then there were these goblins who set up these markets and people realized from the town that the goblins wanted kind of ordinary stuff that they found funny in exchange for their magic trinkets. And so they set up this town and they're starting to trade with the goblins and it's going great until suddenly there's this creature that showed up and now kills anyone who leaves the woods. Not anyone who enters, but anyone who tries to leave, it kills them. And so one thing I'm a little bit unclear about is how it knows, like, when does it attack you when you're leaving, right? <laughs> so it's, it doesn't attack you when you enter, necessarily. Um, it says here on the first page that it kills any who enter the woods. But then at the end, it says, um, kill any who try and leave the woods, in the truth of it. So I'm not sure. The players would probably be able to find ways to deal with that and not end up fighting it. So that's something you'd have to work on, um, because I, I don't know if that makes a ton of sense to me, that it will only be able to attack you right when you're leaving. Like, when, like, is it right when you're about to step foot out? Is it when you make the decision to leave? Is it when you're heading that direction? You know, that's a technicality, but I think it would actually matter, because players tend to harp on technicalities, you know? <laughs> if, you, if you have any normal D&D players, they tend to do that sort of thing. So I would say that's something you're going to want to figure out as you play, because this isn't terribly clear about it. Once or twice there are some spelling errors, or the, the town is called Anchorstone, when it, most of the time it's called Alterstone. Just a few things like that, where, you know, a little few mistakes, but for the most part, that stuff just doesn't matter at all, because the central idea of this dungeon, of this adventure, is so dang good. And that is the three goblin markets. So you have a brief description of the town here. Ivo, the priest, is, um, you know, spoiler alert, he's the big bad guy, which we've seen about a million times. Uh, the priest is the bad guy, but that's okay. It works here because the whole point is that the people aren't worshipping the... Um, basically, they're not worshipping the uh, the things that they used to worship. And so that they need to be punished, and they need to be uh, basically kept out of the woods and, and returned to the worship of the altar stone. And, which is this giant stone, which is outside... Uh, it's a big boulder, taller than any of the trees, which are themselves quite large. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it's just this stone. It, it, it sort of doesn't play any kind of active role in the adventure. It's just there. It's the motivation for the villain, but it doesn't do anything. And I think that's a mistake you could also add in, like, it has a will, because it sounds like it does. It sounds like it drew him out to it, and he's certainly willing to kill for it and do all of these things for it. So... I wonder if there's something in, inside it, or there's a, uh, you know, there's a, a voice that calls from the inside, or something that you could hear, or, or that speaks to you in your mind. Make it more of a cosmic entity, or something like that, and that would make it a little bit more, I think, 
Well, it would make it darker, I think. But it would also make it a little bit more, in, um, I don't know, engaging, I think. But the, the, the town is great. The town is great. It's a solid town. That's, it's not really where the, uh, I think, where the, again, as I said, the, the interest of this adventure is in the, the three goblin markets for which the adventure is named. Entering the wood, you get a random encounter table. And the encounters are precisely the sorts of things that you would expect in a goblin, almost fairy tale ish wood. And these goblins are not goblins from D&D. They're goblins from, you know, fairy tales. They're ridiculous. They're kind of silly. They are whimsical. They're weird. They're fairy goblins as opposed to, you know, monster goblins. And I think that's great. That's why I think it would fit in a Dolmenwood campaign, or at least some of the ideas here would fit in a Dolmenwood campaign. So the random encounters are awesome. I really like the map of the wood as well. It's laid out very, very easily. It's a bit of a point crawl. Now there, it's, it's, there's that central path, and then there aren't really connections other than those those uh, trails. But that's because this is a, a canopy road, basically. So you, when you're in the town of Alterstone, right at the edge of town, there is a tower built into one of the tall, tall trees, and you climb up to the very top of it, and then there's this canopy bridge, this canopy road that goes from tree to tree to tree all into the wood. And it leads all the way to the last goblin market, and then there are stairways that go down to the forest floor at period, periodically along this road. So you're kind of going back and forth. Um, you're going to the road and then traveling further and going down and then going back up and traveling along. So that's why it's laid out this way. It makes a lot of sense. I might add in, and you might not be able to do this yourself, but I might add in like travel times if you didn't take it, because that would be interesting. Say like they get to one location and then for whatever reason the, the, the you know, the road is blocked or the stairway is collapsed or something like that, or goblins are blocking it, whatever it might be, and then they have to find another way around without using that. That could be kind of cool. And so you could add in your own travel times between the points. But you have right here the basic map of the wood where things are in relation to each other and the, and the basic points. That's really cool. And again, I think it's a really cool idea. It's actually very similar to something I used in my West Marches, completely coincidentally. Um, I had a, a fairy wood with goblins, and there were these canopies that had been built by druids and the original founders that went way above the uh, canopy road, that went way above the forest floor, so you didn't have to disturb it as the people walked around. I thought, oh, that's kind of cool when I saw that. I was like, oh, hey, I had that idea too. There is basically one dungeon here, um, the abandoned manor, but there are other places I think you could pretty easily expand into dungeons, uh, but they're just given a little bit of information here. So you have some of the locations, the different paths, the uh, Dead Man's Glade, the Card Shark's campsite, and then you get the description of the markets. And this is where I think this, this book is just awesome. So market skittering. Centipedes, beetles, snails, caterpillars, and ants skitter about everywhere, dancing away from every step that threatens to crush them. The goblins around all seem to ignore the mass of insects, swatting them away playfully or asking nicely for a path cleared. And then you get a description of the goblins who are here. There's chomper, nagging nickel bottom, uh, careless copper nails, hasty haggle snot, scornful spitsworth, talkative ten thumbs. You get the idea, right? The names are really flavorful. The fairy tale goblins rather than monster goblins. And what they're doing is giving you things in exchange for basically normal things, but they're weird normal things. Um, so, for example, if you go to. Uh, Careless Copper Nails. He sculpts small stone ponies, each one the size of his head, dows them in water, and they'll begin to bloom and sprout, growing larger and larger. They'll become loyal ponies, swift as thunder after lightning for a day and a night. That's great. It's a little magic item. You can have your own you know, pocket pony if you want. Copper Nails Price. He charges by the pound, but is too lazy to use the scale himself. He asks the buyer to weigh the pony and inform him it's two gold per pound. The ponies typically weigh 10 pounds, 20 gold, but it's been so long since he's weighed one that he's forgotten. Interesting, right? There's a little bit of sneaky things you could do there. Or let's look at Talkative Ten Thumbs. She paints faces. She can make you into a fox or an ox, or perhaps a gorilla or a chinchilla, or maybe a cute dog or a bullfrog. The effects last as long as you keep the face paint on. The fox, you always go first in combat and are never surprised. Ox, as long as you can balance the load, you can carry anything. Gorilla, your unarmed attacks do two d10 damage. Chinchilla, you can squeeze through tiny gaps. Dog, you can easily follow the scent of something. And bullfrog, leap at five times your height. Her price? All she wants is a piece of homemade art. The older, the better, but she'll take something brand new in a pinch. Great little, uh, you know, 
market options, <laughs> market items. These aren't normal things. You're not going there to buy magic items exactly, and you're not paying in gold. You have to, each of these is sort of an adventure or a test or a task that you have to do in order to get the thing. So, bumbling beetle tongue sells small wooden casks of ale. Crack the cask, serve the beer, and share a cup with strangers. At least two people in the group must have never shared a drink together for the magic to work. If anyone in the group has ill intentions to another, their skin changes to bright purple. Everyone without hostility heals all ability damage after the cask is empty. His price? Share a cask with beetle tongue and get a cask to go. After that, bring beetle tongue five hops plants and get another cask. <laughs> so, um, you know... You have to go out collecting these hops plants. Maybe you have them already, but if you don't, you got to go collect them because that's a really powerful uh, ability to heal all ability damage and to check and see if anybody has ill intentions to another. That's awesome. So that's just market skittering. Then there's market flittering. And it's the same idea there: eager earworms, yellow, yummy yellow tummy, uh, quiver lip, tickety tockety. Tickety tockety has a really crazy ability. So he sells clockworks and he has a timepiece you can buy that you always know when sunset and dawn will happen and you can wind the gears by force and it causes the sun to rise or set prematurely but doing so breaks the timepiece. You have kind of a once like force sunrise or force sunset which is like a crazy powerful item. Um, but it is very fairy tale like right? And that his price is time. He has a ticking helmet worrying endlessly with gears that the buyer must wear. Doing so ages them 3d 12 years and tickety tockety grows visibly younger. So if you want that very powerful item you've got to age yourself and give him your years. That's a really funny idea. Now, the, the helmet, the idea that it's a helmet, I'm not sure. Um, that's not fairy tale ish I probably just have it be he can just do it, right? But either way, it's a great, great idea. Um, and then there's market chittering, which is the last of them exactly. Now, I love it. All the goblins are, are kind of either sympathetic or they laugh and joke about how you're going to be killed horribly by the beast. Um, so you might as well stay here and uh, stay with us. It's great. These are really, really fun, and I think that you could draw so much, so, so many ideas, so much inspiration from these markets. Now, when it comes to the actual dungeon, it's totally fine. I do like how it's laid out. The dungeon room, uh, or the dungeon, is is really interesting. There's a fallen tree that blocks part of it, and you know, if you want to get to the back guest room, for example, you kind of have to jump across uh, through the gallery or, or through the two story hall or through the master. Like you have to try to find a way to cross across to get to the guest room. Um, but it's really just a cool, uh, well-laid-out, very simple dungeon. And I imagine because there's that fallen tree, because there are windows, you could probably get in quite a, different, quite a lot of different ways. Although uh, there are little indicators of where you're supposed to be able to get in, like the guest room, the library, the vestibule, or the kitchen. But again, I think it's a first-floor house. You probably would be able to break through a window somewhere or climb in through a roof. Or I'd probably do it that way. But I like this layout. I think it's great. The dungeon itself is... Pretty straightforward. You're looking around, you're basically trying to find what happened and how Ivo did, first of all, find out that it's Ivo here um, and that, uh, you know, solve the problem of the runes because this is where he, he, he awoke the beast and he, you know, summoned it and tried to take control of it and it got out of hand. And as a result, I mean, he's done some bad things. He's killed people and obviously he's killed one guy in particular who came here and discovered it. And uh, he, he had no choice but to kill him, right? A very villainous thing to say and to feel. There's a really creepy white in the child's bedroom. Um, it's really creepy, and I'm not sure exactly why it's here. Uh, the, their implications there are, are a little horrifying, and it's not gone into any further than that. But it's just it's just disturbing to me. Um, you get the, the uh, different parts of the... And then, of course, uh, eventually you get the Lair of the Beast if you want to go to it. Um, which is a tree as old as the wood itself towers above all others. Roots at the base from form a hill of bark and mud. A perfect circle grown, not cut, leads into the tree. And you go in and face the beast, which is kind of like a really, you know, um, warped wolf, uh, basically. And then you get the beast itself. Um, the warden should make clear what parts of the beast can be attacked. The stone skin, the three runes, and the wolf itself. And the player must specify what they are targeting. So it's kind of an interesting little fight. And then there are some weaknesses. If the beast is exposed to moonlight reflected through a mirror, its stone skin immediately drops to zero HP and no longer provides armor. In its, in its lair, the beast sloughs off the stone skin. It takes an action to reassemble. 
The beast only fears Ivo's mystical rune paints. It will flee upon seeing them brandished. The beast is a creature of habit and always takes the same path through the abandoned manor when it ventures forth. So there are some weaknesses, things you can learn about it. Maybe you could either follow it, learn it that way, or go through the, um, you know, maybe trade with the goblins or find out a way to learn more about the beast or learn it from Ivo himself or whatever it might be. So there is some really cool stuff you could do with the boss of this adventure. And it would be very hard if you just go and try to fight the, the wolf, the, the beast on its own. Basically impossible. So three goblin markets, a fantastic little adventure. Those goblin markets are so delightful. And I would uh, hi highly recommend you guys check this one out. If you're going to run a, a Dolmenwood campaign at some point in the future, you know, steal from these ideas, steal from this market. Maybe even just take it and plug it down into Dolmenwood somewhere, right? That there's these three competing goblin markets. That would be great. The second adventure I wanted to cover is Extend, the Edge of the West. Now, this is essentially a 20-page West Marches campaign. It's incredible. The, the guy who put this, uh, let's see, I think it's Jamie Douglas is who put this together, did so much work on this. The art is all done by one person, by Jamie. The adventure is put together by Jamie. All of the, everything. This is just one person's work. And now the pay what you want suggested price is like $10, I think, which is quite high for a 20 page PDF. And a lot of people are just gonna pocket that, but you can pay what you want. And I would recommend doing something because a lot of work went into this little booklet. And again, it was also designed for a town of forest and a dungeon, but this one's just kind of head and shoulders a lot more work than the others. It really shows. It just the, the, the delightful art is so good. It's, it's, I, love, I love it when people put their, the whole adventure together themselves art themselves. You know, I, I'm not an artist in any way. I have no artistic <laughs> talent. So when I see somebody who is a great designer and also an artist and they put all that together into one product, it just shows, right? It all blends together. It's also cohesive. I love it. And that's what you see with this little booklet. So Exton, the edge of the West, great little uh, filler page there, contents map, uh, Exton itself, uh, the different, uh, and then the different, you know, locations in this region. Reasons to go West, a D20 table for hooks, right? Maybe you might go, if you're making a character, to go out west. The back corner of the Charred Cask Tavern. Delightful, just like a little piece of art right here where your players are probably going to spend a lot of time around that table. An awesome little idea. And then you get the map in two pages. Um, and again, it's just a delightful map. It's been drawn with care and attention. The layout is actually quite good in terms of, I think, the proximity and the time uh, to get to adventure locations, you're much it's much easier to get to adventures along the road because it only takes two hours to travel along the road. So the Watchtower, the Burn Village, the Hegemony Soldiers Encampment, uh, Farragal Prison, the Quarry, and the Outlaw Hideout are gonna be the first places that you're gonna check, and probably the Watchtower is first, and the Burn Village, right? Like there's gonna be uh, the Quarry. You're gonna go out as West Marches do, right? You go out in sort of a, a region first, in the initial region. And that travel time is going to really help that. And then as you go further, you start to get to the mound or the island or the ruin, the round top, the cave, that you go further and further out. And you're going to find harder and harder things out there, especially the ruin, which is kind of the big dungeon. Now also, because it's on a lake, you can easily get to the ruin. So once you are high enough level to map it out and start actually to try to take it, it's easy to get there and easy to leave. Now, none of these locations are very, very detailed. You just get a little bit of information. Exton gets the most, where you just, or maybe Exton and the ruin itself. But it's a frontier town. You get who it's governed by. It's under threat by certain threats, right? You have the tavern, which of course the players need to know. And you have some rumors. And that's it. Then you get the, the other locations, the Watchtower, the Queen's Road, and what happens there. The Burn Village of Woosbridge, and what's going on there in day or night, some encounter tables. You get the Hegemony Soldiers Encampment, the Outlaw Hideout, and the Quarry, and what's going on there day or night. The Farragall Prison, with a, with a great little dungeon map. Why you might need to go there is left up to you as a, as a DM or as a, as a player. As the, you, know, you could put something there, put a reason to go there. Maybe the players break the law and get in prison and they have to break out. Whatever it might be, you have it right here. Lake Wismere. Deep, dark, deep water. Boatmen don't row too far out. So maybe you don't actually take a, a, a boat to the ruin. But you can certainly maybe follow the follow the, the coastline or something like that. Then you have the island, which has some stuff going on there, a ruin, for example. Somewhere it is said there sits a time-worn mossy shrine. So there's a, a ruin on the island, but that's all you're given. 
And then Strudwood, Strudwood Forest? Strudwad? I, Strudwad, I can't say that. <laughs> Here ends civilization, as far as those in the east are concerned. The woods are thick and haunted. The lands to the west haven't been accurately mapped by Easterners in a few hundred years. So this is the very border of civilization. Vitrid Drone. Uh, you get a cool map of an insect hive. Cool dungeon there. Then you get Round Top, a Cliff Cave, Spirit Talker's Hut. Different locations you can run into out there. And then the Ruin. And I love that he has this um, little thing added in here. They know the Dog Tower's secret. That's great. 2d4 hostile adventurers escaping with sacks of coins. They know a secret. So if you run into them, hey, they, not only do they have sacks of coins, maybe you take those from them, but they know the secret. So you can negotiate with them and talk, and they don't necessarily have to kill them all. And what's interesting here is that there's a question. The ruin. Who built these? Does anything live here now? And then you get the ruin. Baztex quarters, the departure tower, the lab, safe tower, the observatory, the barn tower, the dog tower, and the big tower. And you have a little bit of information about each of them, but not a ton. I mean, you can develop this into your own dungeon very easily. There's Baztac. He's a kind of a big bad. Um, yeah, extra mouths in place of a right eye, which is really creepy. And some spells, which are really cool spells. Energize Rope, Windborne, Burnishing, Bubble, Architect's Perfection. That's great. And then some random encounters near the back. Exton, the Edge of the West, is a mini setting geared towards a West March style TTRPG. So this one is super straightforward, but so much care has been put into this. I, I, I just love this little setting. And if you're interested in running a West Marches, a short West Marches, just to get the style of it down, you don't want to put in all the work yourself or you don't know how to do a lot of that stuff, well, this is a great place to start. You get this little document, you build off of it, and, man, you would be all set to run a long-ish campaign in, uh, in, in a West Marches setting. And it's a great one. Man, I, I, <laughs> I love this. I think I would like to run... I, I like to make... I like to run West Marches. And I think at some point I would like to use Extant as the basis for a quick West Marches, like, just to introduce it to new people. Run, like, a six-month West Marches in this uh, setting. It would be so good. So the next one I wanted to cover is Blue Home, the Necropolis of Nuremen. Now this is a kind of an interesting adventure for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's for a system that I just hadn't been familiar with before I ran into this particular one. And it's really interesting, I have to say that. I'm not sure if I would ever run the system. I might review it at some point. But the adventure feels... I'm not sure how to put this. It feels so perfectly old school. Like, I'm not even sure how exactly to describe it. Is there something about the particular town that's presented, the, the, the backstory of what's going on, the maps that are used, the, the public domain art that's used? The front page notwithstanding, which I think doesn't really feel like the rest of the adventure. That's one criticism I might have, is that this doesn't really fit with the rest of the adventure. But the, the, the adventure itself, as you'll see, it just feels so old school. It feels like, I'm not even sure, something straight out of the, the 70s and 80s in terms of D&D. I really like this, just the vibe of it throughout. So what we get is um, essentially a, a typical dungeon. It was out in the wood. It was an evil town. <laughs> this idea that this these, these people built this town called Law's End because it was beyond the reach of all kings of the realm. And uh, they wanted they wanted to do crazy stuff out there, whatever they wanted to do. It's the Las Vegas of the fantasy world. <laughs> and it, as you might imagine, it went very, very badly. Everything fell apart. Uh, everyone died. It was a disaster. The forest was sort of an elven forest, and the people pushed the elves out a lot. Um, and now goblins have come in to settle, and there's some other evil things happening out there. And so there's a place called the Delving Wood, there's the Elf Way, which is the road out to it. And then you have Camlin Castle and the people there. Um, Leica of the Lily is the current lady of the castle. She's a canny politician and keeps the peace by dealing equitably with all comers that are open to reason, including the goblins and the elves. So you have a, a base location. Now you don't have any maps of them until the end, but there's um, just a lot of cool stuff here. Rumors that are going about the White Company, which is a bandit group out in the woods 
You get some random encounter tables, which are very straightforward, but the art here, I think this is all public domain art. I know at least the cover is, and throughout there's a lot of public domain art, but it works so well to give a very particular tone. It doesn't always fit exactly with what's being described in the room or the region, but it comes pretty close, and it gives you certainly the tone that you're looking for. Like, I mean, yeah, this art here, I love this piece. Now, the dungeon itself is pretty straightforward, but there are some really cool things, and I like that there are um, things that you can negotiate with, things you can talk to right away. The goblins have gone down here, and some of them have stayed behind as guards, so right away you can run into these goblin guards and talk to them. The dungeon itself, again, layout of it, old school in its design, not tech, not really my favorite in terms of its design. You know, things aren't bolded, things aren't bullet pointed. You do have monsters, I mean, you do have some bolding, I should take that back. You have magic items that are bolded. And you do have, like, monsters that are set aside with bolding, but there isn't a lot of really easy, um, at a glance running this. And sometimes the descriptions here aren't terribly useful, so the huge hall is littered with skeletons, some still in armor. All here died in the disaster that befell Lou's Law's end. Well, I would imagine so. Um, a search will reveal a few coins and little else. Nothing of real import is to be found in this chamber. It's stuff like that, you're like, okay. <laughs> Nothing of real import. But you've told me a, a few things that are actually quite interesting, like this room has recently been looted. That's important. Um, you can't find anything there, but, but the fact that it's been recently looted and somebody has come through, maybe that is important there. So some of this just is, doesn't fit my preference for writing and my preference for, for ease of reading. But again, I, it fits right in with sort of more old school design, where this sort of paragraph text and this sort of information given to you it's just pretty common. It's, it's what you get in old school game design. And so for that reason, I think it fits with that, with that vibe. The, again, the, the, the dungeon has been designed so that it makes sense. And I like that. I always appreciate that, that there are things here that would make sense. <laughs> again, this art fits really well with, with the, the tone of the adventure and what's going on. There are some puzzles that you have to solve here as well that I kind of like. And, uh, and they require you to look closely at tapestries and read books and, you know, do some work to try to find what's going on here. Uh, you can find some elixirs to drink and you don't want to necessarily drink them. If anyone is foolish enough to drink any of the elixirs, roll a d8 and they are bad. Become violently sick. Assume a virulent shade of complexion for d4 months. Turn painfully into a frog, bird, or insect, or writhe and scream in pain for several minutes and finally die a horrible death. Old school in the stuff that happens to you. If you're stupid enough to drink random liquids from an alchemist's lab, you're not probably going to feel... Uh, an evil alchemist's lab, you're probably not going to feel very good. Um, there's some really interesting items here, and the art for them is really, really evocative. The underground lake, the cave of magic bones, caves of the troglodytes, the antechamber, the priest's rooms, the chamber of instruments, the temple, the ancient ancestral burial crypts. The stuff you're going down to fight at the very end is wraiths and zombies and whites and, and things like that. You're not, you know, it's not terribly, terribly, terribly surprising. But it's well done. It's And the presentation of this book is really well done. If you're looking for an old school, um, I would say solid old school dungeon that doesn't fall into a lot of the mistakes old school adventures do in terms of its design, its layout. The dungeon design is pretty good um, with a great town nearby. And you just want that old school feeling. Like this just makes me, like again, I, I don't know, this, this reminds me of when I was a kid and I would open up my brother's you know, RPG books and I'd read through the adventures that I wasn't supposed to read through because you know, he was the one going to be running games and things like that. Um, or or through, you know, looking back through my cousin's books and things like that. This is the sort of adventure that I feel I would see. So I don't know, I just wanted to highlight it and, and bring it to your guys' attention. It has actually a second dungeon which is the Lair of Lothar, which is a, sort of the bandit camp, as is part of an epilogue if you want to continue forward. Now here's the map of the area. I love the map. I think it's really, really good. You've got the Delving Wood right there. You have Camlin, Camlin Castle. You have the Elf Way, the Star Ferry, and then you have Blueholm up there. Um, the uh, Law's End, which is that mark at the very top, near the Blue Mountains. And then you have the, the Castle Camlin and the Lair of Lothar here as well. And then the Necropolis of Niramen itself, 
And I really like the layout. It's looped. You get uh, some secret doors. You do get some branching paths. But you're, you're not really getting trapped down one long hallway and then having to walk back or backtrack. There's a lot of maneuver around the dungeon. And that's just the first floor. Then you get the second floor, which is, again, similar. You get those loops. That's what I mean. This is a Jaquade dungeon. So this is a dungeon that is not doesn't fall into some of the traps that you see for old school games where they follow everything old school games do, including all the bad, right, in my view. It does have some of that... Um, some of the less agile parts of old school games, I think, is the way to put it in terms of its writing and presentation. But but the content is good. It's really good. It's really solid. The adventure seems quite fun. And I just love it. I think there's something about the design of it that's delightful. I really, really like it. The, the public domain art, art works really well, and I love these dungeon maps. They're so good. They're gritty. And they feel, again, like something you would draw just at your own table if you, if you knew how to hatch really well. <laughs> So, Blue Home, the Necropolis of Nuremen, highly recommend. Um, and it certainly is modular, right? You could plug this in almost anywhere and use it, and that's great. So, Blue Home, the Necropolis of Nuremen, Exton, the Edge of the West, and Three Goblin Markets. Highly recommend all three. I'll put links below to where you can get them. All right, guys, I hope this has been an interesting video, and I'll see you in another one.